Good morning. Thank you all for being here. I thought that we might have to wake y'all up this morning, but that is clearly not the case. Everyone seems to be bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and I want to welcome you um, this morning. Thank you for joining the Hillsborough Commission on the Status of Women for this forum on the sex trafficking of minors. We intend to move very quickly this morning. We have a lot to cover, um, a lot of information, and we want you to leave here today with ways that each of us can help in our community with this issue. My name is Yvonne Fry, and I'm honored to be the chair of the Hillsborough Commission on the Status of Women. I also sit on the Florida Commission on the Status of Women and just returned last night from our quarterly meetings in Tallahassee. I bring greetings and their support as we dig deeper into this issue. I'd like to share that the Hillsborough Commission on the Status of Women was created to study and make recommendations to the Board of County Commissioners, the County Administration, the community, and all agencies and persons in Hillsborough County on issues pertaining to the status of women, including discrimination, employment, education, daycare, and health care. Um, and I would add to that safety. Our focus on the Commission is on the three C's, communication, collaboration, and a sense of community. And we believe that our attention on an issue not only heightens awareness, but allows stakeholders in the community to come together to advance their efforts. Last year's forum that we held on the women's veterans issues produced some great results in this way. At this time, I'd like to recognize um, several people in the room. First and foremost, I would like to recognize my fellow commissioners on the Commission on the Status of Women. They are serving as table hosts today, and I so appreciate um, the opportunity to serve alongside of you. Would each of you please stand and be recognized? Thank you. I'd also like to thank the University of Tampa for their generous hospitality. They've provided the room and the refreshments and um, a warm welcome this morning. Linda Devine, thank you so much. And Linda has reached out across campus. We have students, faculty, administration, and so on, and they actually have more than what, what one table should hold, but they, um, they had such great response across campus and are excited to be part of this conversation as well. I'd also like the to thank the Tampa Kiwanis Foundation for a generous grant to help underwrite our issues forums. Linda DeQuilla is here representing um, them, but she's also a member of the Commission on the Status of Women. And I'd like to personally thank Linda for the many, many hours, including baking bread and um, cookies and such and so forth, um, all that she has done to make today a, such a success. You are a tremendous asset to the Commission and to our community. Thank you. <laughs> Another one of our sponsors today is the League of Women Voters of Hillsborough County. We have Mickey Castor, the president, is with us. Thank you. Hillsboro TV is a tremendous partner to us. They're here. They have um, helped us with all of our events mm -hmm. in being able to take it beyond the room and out into the community, which is such a vital piece of this. And we thank them for their partnership and support. They are amazing. We also would like to thank the Athena Society, in particular, Dina Levengood, um, who is chair of the Community Action Committee for um, her support with training with our facilitators and hosts and so forth. She's put a lot of time and effort into this. Could we give her a round of applause? And I'd like to ask that um, any members of Athena that are here today, would you please stand and be recognized as well? We have current and former um, elected officials. First of all, I'd like to welcome um, very warmly our state attorney, Mark Ober. Um, Senator Helen Gordon Davis is here. <laughs> Looking as beautiful as ever. Um, State Representative Janet Cruz. <laughs> Hillsborough Sc County School Board Chair Candy Olson. Thank you. <laughs> Hillsborough County School Board Member April Griffin. She's coming, she's on her way. Um, and it says former, but it's, it's always going to be. I, I still refer to you as Mayor. Mayor Pam Iorio, thank you so much for being here. 
Um, I see the Honorable Dottie Berger McKinnon in the crowd as well. And I know that there are so many distinguished guests here. Um, if I've missed anybody, please, my, my apologies, that is on me for sure. If you would reference um, your materials in the packet that's provided, there are some other resources and information there of some of the other um, groups and organizations that are represented and have played a part in today. We'd especially honored to welcome June Wallace, who is the driving force behind the Clearwater Tampa Bay Task Force on Human Trafficking. June, would you stand to be recognized? Where'd she go? Oh. Yes. And at this time, I'd like to introduce the Commission on the Status of Women uh, Vice Chair, Dottie Gruber Skipper, who was um, such an asset to us in putting this all together. She does work um, in this issue and, and, and surrounding issues and she has worked very hard to bring our distinguished facilitators, the questions for our consideration that we'll see a little bit later, and, the, and also the fact sheets. And she was the primary liaison with um, the commission to the Clearwater Tampa Bay Task Force on Human Trafficking, and we'd like to recognize her dedication to this issue in our community. Please help me join in welcoming Dottie Gruber Skipper. Thank you, Yvonne. I have the wonderful pleasure to introduce our first speaker. Uh, mayor, I feel the same way, Mayor Pam Iorio is a former two-term mayor of Tampa who has launched a second career as a leadership speaker and author, successfully leading the vibrant and growing city of Tampa for two terms. Uh, mayor Pam grappled with change, goal setting, compromise, and adversity. Now as a leadership speaker for corporations and trade associations, she delivers an inspiring and empowering message about straightforward leadership, the importance of leading yourself well so that you can better lead other people. Her leadership book, Straightforward, Ways to Live and Lead, was called the best business book of 2011 by Florida Trend Magazine. You know, I could go on and on and on about Mayor uh, Pam, um, but currently she serves the, uh, uh, on the advisory board for Celestar Corporation, a fast-growing knowledge and technology consulting company. She serves on the board of the USF Foundation and is acting executive director for the Children's Board of Hillsborough County. And she also is married. And um, with, with again, I could go on and on, but I won't. Mayor, let's get on to the program. So Mayor Pam Iorio, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. It's great to be here. And one of the other things I do is I'm the leader in residence at UT's College of Business. So it's always wonderful to be here on this beautiful campus. And I've been able to have an inside look at how this wonderful university works and educates its students and I tell you it is a first-rate institute uh, and that we can all be very proud that we have the University of Tampa right here in the city core educating so many wonderful young people so it's great to be here at UT this morning and thank you Yvonne for your kind words and Dottie and and for inviting me today to say a few words uh, to be with a great group of civic leaders who want to do good in the community um, I've been privileged over the past three months to be a part of the Children's Board of Hillsborough County. And so I've been able to learn a great deal about what the Children's Board does and how much it invests in the community in so many different ways. So $27 million it invests in about 25 different agencies, really focusing on children zero to eight years old. And um, it's making a real difference. A lot of agencies in this community doing important work, doing difficult work. And so it's gotten me to hear some stories firsthand about the challenges that we face in our community. Um, and many of the stories, and almost all of them, really touch your heart, inspire you to go on and try to do even more. But perhaps nothing has touched me more than a briefing that I received the other day from someone here who's here today who's uh, been working very hard on this issue. Then this issue of um, sex tra trafficking of minors. Uh, there's not a mother who after hearing of this horror isn't deeply, deeply affected. 
And it's one of those issues that once it's really brought to your attention in all its graphic detail, that you just can't shake it. You can't shake it. It's one of those issues that you just go home or you lay in bed at night and you just ruminate about it. And you think, how can this happen? How can this happen? Most of us travel in circles in parts of our community where we are with people who live pretty good lives. And so we get lulled sometimes into thinking that this world is good for almost everybody. But then we bump up against a reality, depending on where sometimes we put our charitable efforts. And so then we see that life isn't always good for everybody. In terms of the spectrum of good and evil, this falls way, way over on the evil side to such an extent that it really shakes us to our very core. And we wonder how we could go about our daily lives and just not try to do something to help every single young person who's been swept into this horror. Now, a certain portion of young girls who are part of this sex trafficking are abducted. And uh, it is really simply by chance, turning left instead of turning right. But then there is this other, even greater percentage of young girls who are at risk because of their home life or a lack of a home life. And I see this a great deal with the agencies that we serve with the Children's Board. These are very vulnerable young people who have been brought up in damaged circumstances through no fault of their own. Every young person deserves a good life, but they are, all of them aren't dealt those cards. And so they try to escape an unhappy home, and then they find themselves in the, in the grips of this horrible, horrible situation that they can't get out of. And so we ask ourselves, just what can we do about it? Well, the first thing that the Status of Women Commission has done today by bringing all of you together is to make all of us aware of the gravity of the situation and to come to grips with the fact that it is occurring right here in this hometown that we all love so much. That even in Tampa, the place that we consider the best place in the whole wide world to live, that this horror is going on. And then all of us, and of course I'm speaking to a group that already knows this, but all of us know that when we've been given gifts, that then it's our obligation to give back. So if we've been given the gift of growing up in a good home, receiving a good education, being surrounded by people who actually love us and support us, if we've been given the gift of public service, of being able to work in the charitable environment, the gift of being in law enforcement, if we've been given the gift of empathy, if we've been given the gift of compassion, then it really is our obligation to put those gifts to use and to work to make life better for others. Today's breakfast is highlighting a group of young girls who are so vulnerable, so at risk, and are living a horror. And we have to put our gifts to use to help save them. Every person we save makes this world a better place. So it's my privilege to be amongst you this morning, to be amongst givers and people who really do want to make this world a better place and save even one life. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I now want to introduce, I have the honor of introducing uh, Detective James McBride. Detective McBride was selected as the lead, in, lead investigator on the Clearwater Tampa Bay Area Human, Task Force, Tra Human Trafficking Task Force in August of 2006. 
As the lead investigator, he is responsible for building relationships with all ethnic communities, non-governmental agencies, faith-based organizations, and law enforcement agencies within Hillsborough, Pinellas, and Pasco counties. His duties include the investigation of human trafficking, sex trafficking, domestic sex trafficking, labor trafficking, domestic servitude, human smuggling, and fraudulent immigration document organizations. Detective McBride and the Clearwater Area Human Task Force uh, and Tampa Bay Area Human Fast Task Force are assisting the Regional Community Policing Institute and the Department of Justice with the Immersion Learning Program. This program was designed to assist other human trafficking task force with investigative techniques and task force management. Detective James McBride is currently partnering with the Florida Regional Community Policing Institute as the president of the International Association of Human Trafficking Investigators. Please welcome Detective James McBride. Good morning. It's an honor to be here this morning representing the Clearwater Tampa Bay Area Human Trafficking Task Force. I would like to thank a lot of the facilitators. There are all the facilitators that are out there today. Uh, all of them are members of the task force in one uh, way, shape, or form. Either they are an investigator uh, here with the FBI, Homeland Security Investigations as well, uh, your state and local law enforcement. And we also have facilitators that are here with our non-governmental organizations and also concerned citizens and community leaders that are a part of our task force assisting us as we go forward to uh, investigate and rescue persons that are, are, are victims of this horrible crime. I'd like to start out by giving you a brief background on the task force and then discuss what is human trafficking and how is it affecting the Tampa Bay area. And we're gonna stay specific towards domestic minor sex trafficking. There's many different forms of human trafficking. They're all here within the Tampa Bay area. Every type of investigation that is out there, we have done as a task force here within the Tampa Bay area, which includes Pinellas, Pasco, and Hillsborough counties. So we're gonna uh, specifically stay on track with the uh, minor sex trafficking. Uh, also, lastly, what can you as the community do to assist law enforcement in rescuing and restoring the victims of these crimes? The background of the task force is we started back in 2006. We're funded by the Department of Justice. We received our first grant from DOJ and uh, basically we had no training. There was no manuals on how to do these types of investigations. There was no manual on how to run a task force um, and there was no manual on how to rescue and restore victims. So basically we were starting off with nothing, just a, bit, a little bit of money. And uh, what we were able to do as a team is we were able to bring together not only the law enforcement partners, but also the non-governmental organizations and those organizations that are out there to assist us with the victims and also bring them and law enforcement together. This is a different type of crime that we in law enforcement are not used to dealing with. This is a victim-centered approach type of investigation. It is extremely involved. You are dealing with young ladies, uh, in this case, you're dealing with underage minors or US citizens, that sometimes they come to you and they have a lot of trauma, especially from having to deal with uh, what they had to deal with, with these organizations, which I'll get into in just a, uh, just a few moments. Well, with the task force, they also started, the FBI has started the Innocence Loss Task Force that's run by FBI Special Agent Greg Christopher. He couldn't be here today. He's been very busy on multiple cases within the federal system and he did uh, receive a conviction on a major case that was out of Tampa, stemming between Tampa and Orlando. And he did, he, he's a phenomenal worker, hard worker, and uh, he does a great job and we work hand in hand together. We're two separate task forces, but we looked at this issue as a major issue within the Tampa Bay area, which is Pinellas, Pasco and Hillsborough County. And we are seeing that we're all interconnected. As law enforcement agencies, as prosecutorial, uh, we're all interconnected. The traffickers move about, okay? We are recovering juveniles here in the Tampa Bay area involved in prostitution that are not from the Tampa Bay area because these traffickers are moving in and out. We're seeing them come from other parts of, of the nation and moving through this area and also going out and around the, uh, what we would call the circuit here in the state of Florida and the United States. They're using multiple means out there to advertise these uh, uh, children 
They're using the internet. They're using word of mouth. Um, they're also networking amongst themselves. They themselves are using technology to their advantage. They're using technology to circumvent law enforcement. And every time we, we think we've got them figured out, they change up how they're doing things. So these investigations have become very difficult for us and have uh, progressed over time. This year, uh, in July, the new state law, the Florida state law was signed on human trafficking. We have, since 2006, had a human trafficking state law, but the law was very lacking in many areas, and one area it was lacking in was the domestic minor sex trafficking area. Uh, July 1st, our legislature unanimously, unanimously voted in, passed the law, and then the governor signed it in July. And what we see with the new law, the new law states, United States citizens can be victims of human trafficking. It is right in the state law, as well as it changed the uh, wording for certain things involving domestic minor sex trafficking victims. One of the things that it did do is it actually defined, oh, thank you, is that my time up? <laughs> uh, with that, it actually defined what a commercial sex act is. Um, so it defined it as prostitution, dancing in the strip clubs, uh, even if there's no prostitution taking place, if you're an underage minor and you're, you're in this, that is considered a commercial sex act, as well as being uh, forced to perform pornography type acts for, for uh, commercial, commercial gain. Also, uh, some of the things that it changed, it also defined coercion. And in that coercion, it defined specific types of coercion, and it even defined the use of Schedule One and Schedule Two drugs for coercing somebody, enforcing them into prostitution, keeping them there, that addiction, keeping that addiction don't, going so that person has to come back to me in order to get their, their fix, and I can keep them going out there and prostituting because that's the only way that you're going to get your fix. So that, that's one of the changes. Another change is 17 years of age and under. If you are 17 years of age or under and you're involved in a commercial sex act and somebody is profiting off that sex act, it's, it's a crime now. Before it wasn't. I would have to show force, fraud, and coercion was being involved with the juvenile. Now we do not. We do not have to show force, fraud, and coercion. All we have to do as law enforcement is show that this child was involved in a commercial sex act and somebody was profiting off of it. The state also was able to give us some really stiff penalties. 17, 16, 15 years of age. If you're the victim, it's a first, it's a first degree felony. If the victim is 14 years of age or under, it is now a life felony in the state of Florida. And, it, and we're very proud of that. Our state law is one of the stiffest state laws in the United States. And I'm very proud to stand up here and say that because I do travel the United States and help out other agencies. We work with other agencies outside the area and they're very impressed by what Florida has done with the state law. I, now what I wanna do is kind of bring home what we're seeing here in the Tampa Bay area. I, th we have worked several cases here, um, all the way up through prosecution, and received some stiff penalties. Uh, one of the cases uh, that we worked uh, is stemmed from St. Petersburg, Pinellas County area, over to the Tampa Bay area. And that just shows why we must work together as law enforcement. We must work together as the Tampa Bay area to assist, uh, to assist in these investigations. Young lady, straight A student in high school, spoke three languages, student body president, okay? Upset, left for the day, you know, angry with parents, was recruited, told that she could come here, over here, and meet some people that could take care of her. And basically, what happened is, is those persons were traffickers, pimps, and it was male and female. And that's another misnomer that a lot of people think it's just males that are, that are perpetrating human trafficking. There are female pimps out there. There are females out there that are perpetrating this particular type of, uh, of crime. They worked together, and, and actually what they did, they were pimping out four different juveniles within the Tampa Bay area. Um, and those four juveniles were recovered. The suspects were arrested, and they were prosecuted in federal court. One of the agents that worked that case, well, all of us actually worked the case together, but one of the uh, uh, lead agents is here, that's uh, Homeland Security Investigation uh, Investigator uh, Bill Williger, he's here, and then Greg Christopher from the uh, Innocence Loss Task Force worked that case along with local and state law enforcement, and we all must work together. 
With that, we had another case that stemmed from Clearwater. With that case, we recovered an underage minor. She was 14 years of age. How she came to us is what we found at uh, health department. We get out there, we train people, okay? And that's what we need. We need more people out there training the community. How many people here have heard of human trafficking or had the knowledge that this was going on before today? And if, okay, and then you have those that do not. The majority of the community out there does not know that this is happening. The majority. And we need to get that information out there. Well, with that, we did some training. The health department employee had some training. A young girl that was 14 came in. She was pregnant. She explained that she was from Mexico. She was actually a missing person in Mexico. And she was brought here to the United States. She was smuggled into the United States, specifically to be somebody's, con what we would say, a concubine. In other words, she would have to have sex with him every day and also clean the house. She didn't go to school. She wasn't allowed outside of the house. If she did not perform the sex acts that he wanted, she was beaten. The only reason she was able to get away is he impregnated her, and she, he, did not want, he didn't want anything to do with that. So basically, he dropped her off at family's house and threatened her, which is what we see a lot with the pimps and the traffickers, a lot of threatening. What we were able to do is we were able to, as a task force, recover this juvenile. She came in, we found out, we were able to give her services, but unfortunately, we don't have all the services as we need to help out these victims. And some things did fall through the cracks, and I will explain that in just a few. But we were able to locate the suspect. We were able to arrest him outside of the area with the help of the U.S. Marshals, and, uh, um, and uh, he was taken into custody. What, is, what, what can you do as a community to help us in law enforcement? What you can do is get out there and understand that we do not have all the services that we need. I do not, as of today, if I recover a juvenile, which I have four or five right now that I know I can put into a home, I don't have a place to, to put them. I have to use the system that's already out there. And with that, unfortunately, the system is not created to help out these types of, these types of victims. And unfortunately, they're not getting the services they need. And when they're not getting the services they need, they're not restored enough to where they can assist me and our prosecution with uh, going after these traffickers and prosecuting and putting them in jail. We need that assistance, and that's what we're reaching out to you for as law enforcement community, is you as a community to help us get the awareness out there and, and, and help us provide services for these victims. I would like to uh, thank you today for having me here. Um, I appreciate the uh, opportunity to speak with you. It's been my passion for the last six years working. When you work with one of these victims, it will change your life forever. And it has changed my life. And, and I, I really appreciate the opportunity to represent those victims here today and be the voice of the victims. Thank you. Thank you, Detective McBride. You know, it is about the survivors of this horrific monster, uh, the reason that we're here today. So thank you very much. I now have the wonderful pleasure to introduce Laura Hamilton. Laura Hamilton is a human trafficking analyst with the Clearwater Police Department, Criminal and Investigations Division, and the Department of Justice Human Trafficking Task Force. Laura serves as a subject matter expert on the topic of domestic child sex trafficking, providing training and presentations to groups throughout Central Florida, such as the University of South Florida, St. Leo University, Human Services Coalition of Pinellas County, Hillsborough County Children's Services Advisory Board, and the Pasco County School Board Service Providers, and many, many others. She has over 30 years experience, and that's amazing to me, she just doesn't look that old, um, within the corporate and faith-based communities in Hillsborough, Pinellas, and Polk counties. Her specialties include business development, program planning, intellectual property, grants, proposals, and management, teaching and youth discipleship, um, I could go on, but Laura obtained her bachelor's degree in biomedical sciences and her master's in public health and global health practice at the University of South Florida. Laura is also president and founder of Bridging Freedom, a therapeutic safe home in development that will rehabilitate children who have been rescued from minor sex trafficking and traumatized by commercial sex exploitation. So welcome, Laura.
Thank you for coming. I know this is uh, quite an effort on your part to get up this early and um, to join us here to hear about this horrible and horrific and hidden crime within our community. <clears throat> I know that um, it's, a, it's a hard pill to swallow, especially if you haven't heard of it before, to know that a child can just be taken by somebody who it just sees that child as money and to turn that child's life upside down and to bring such trauma to that child, uh, not only physical trauma, can you imagine 15 to 30 men a night? 15, I, I don't, even if it was just five a night, every night, they don't get a day off. Uh, even if it was just one, can you imagine your child being made to service a, another person every every day of their life, multiple times. So this child finds herself in this position and she's very traumatized physically. But more than that, emotionally, she is scarred for life. Um, she's messed up. She needs specialized therapy. Can you imagine just yourself if, if something were to come against you and, and even one, one experience like that, you would need a lot of therapy. But a child who's so impressionable really has been, her innocence has been stolen, her childhood has been stolen, and in place of that, she's received trauma. So that's why well, Detective McBride mentioned that we don't have the services today. Um, this crime has mounted from within the past 30 to 40 years has increased from such a, an underground organized crime to a crime that every pimp on the street sees an opportunity, says, you know what, I hear about that, I'm gonna do that too. And they find, there's so many vulnerable kids out there that they find it. Florida has 30 to 40,000 runaways every year. Every year, 30 to 40,000 more. One in three of those kids are going to be approached by a trafficker within 48 hours. They're vulnerable. That trafficker can come up at a bus stop, the mall, um, in front of a juvenile justice center, um, you name it. That trafficker knows where kids hang out and he'll go there, McDonald's, and within 30 seconds can assess the vulnerability of that child and will make a promise that's the whole key here. He reaches out and he promises her or him. Now the majority of these kids are girls, but more and more we're finding that um, young boys are bought into this. There's a demand for that as well. Um, so these kids are promised something, uh, a safe place, uh, food, and more importantly, love. Do you know that these kids that run away, they're running away because there's a void in their life, there's a problem, there's an issue. They run away because they can't handle it anymore. And they stumble into something that seems so appealing. Now there is, that's 75% of the kids. There are the 25% of the kids that are taken off the streets, that are recruited out against their will. They blindsided, they didn't see it coming. But the problem here is huge. FBI is rescuing, what, 25 to 30 girls per year? just one investigator. We now have funding for three or four more. What, we're just gonna find that many more kids. What are we gonna do with them? Our services that we have nowadays, Joshua House, doing a wonderful program for these kids that are at risk. Pace Center for Girls, wonderful, wonderful programs that's turning the lives of these young girls into productive women that can one day stand before a group and say, you know what? This is what that organization did for me. But there is no organization within the Tampa Bay area for the population of girls that Detective McBride, um, our FBI Innocence Loss Initiatives are rescuing. That's a lot of kids in this area. There would be more if there were more investigators. There's nowhere to put these kids. Our country, not only does Tampa Bay not have an area for these kids, our state doesn't. Nowhere in the state of Florida has a long-term therapeutic safe home for these kids. In fact, our country only has about, not even less than 10, 
less than five homes within our country. There's Wellspring Living in Georgia doing a great work. They've been up and running with minors for about three or four years. Freedom Place in Houston or in Texas has just opened their doors. Ann's House at Salvation Army, we have a, one of our facilitators, works with human services with Salvation Army. They've been doing human trafficking for hundreds of years, but they've not seen it escalated to this epidemic level within the past 10 years. They have a great program in Chicago for these girls. That's a very few number of homes. Florida needs about five homes. Why do we need these? Because the child has Stockholm Syndrome. She has trauma bonding. That's, Dottie, please let me know when my time's up because I can certainly go on and on. Um, she has that trauma bonding. Many of you are my age, um, maybe a little younger. Um, you know Patty Hearst's story, right? She was kidnapped, went to jail because she would not accuse her attacker. She would not point him out. And our facilitators here at work in prosecution know that it's so frustrating that that victim cannot reach out and point because of fear or because of that trauma bonding that she has experienced. They run away right back to it. They are somehow, it's a, a phenomenon that the brain chemistry changes when you go under such trauma that this bonding occurs normalization occurs, personal power is lost, and um, just the, your human nature is to comply and just go into survival mode. These girls need a specialized home. They're just running back into the same situation time and time again. They only live seven years in this lifestyle. They die of a disease, right? You know how many diseases must come into her life? She dies from abuse of not only the trafficker, but from the buyer. The buyer, I, I can't even, I'm not gonna disrupt your breakfast, but I can't even tell you what that buyer does to that child, because it's not a child to him or her. It's a thing. He doesn't see that child as a real person. Somehow he can dissociate himself or herself, because these are women that are in, coming into this activity as well. So she's damaged, um, she needs a lot of care. What you can do today is you can become aware. You've each got your own circles. You've got your own circles of friends, your family, number one. Let your kids know you cannot be by yourself, right? If you're 12 years old walking down the road, buddy system, isn't that what we learned? First thing in, in what, first grade? Um, let your families know, be safe, be smart. Yes, we wanna live free and, and, and confident, but we also have to know that this danger exists in our community. Let your families know, let your circles of friends know that this is going on and that we can do something about it. Everybody's got skills and abilities and passion. Find your passion and start letting your abilities, whatever those are, connect because there is such a need for the whole community to be involved in this solution because it is huge. Every part of society has to come together to create a solution for this. Um, at your tables today, think hard. You have the opportunity of a lifetime to come in at the grassroots level and to create a program here in the Tampa Bay area, one that doesn't exist, one that doesn't exist in Florida, you can be a part of bringing forth solutions that our key leaders within the community can start to build upon and to make a reality for the healing of these girls that are rescued by our law enforcement. Thank you for having us today. Thank you so much, Laura. At this time, we're gonna start our roundtable discussions where each of us can generate ideas that help us turn the information today into actionable ways we can affect change in our community. And I, I'd like Dina um, Levengood to make her way up for a couple of instructions, but the thing that I want you to remember is that you can't do it all. No one of you can do it all. 
but certainly you can do something. And with that, um, it, hopefully it's not too overwhelming of a task. Dean is going to give us some instructions and get us started with this portion. Good morning. <clears throat> I will make this very brief. <clears throat> you each have at your table a host moderator, and you also have a facilitator. And uh, your facilitator has some very special expertise, but we are not asking them to make presentations to you at the table. We're going to work this out. There's an opportunity here for you to share your ideas and your thoughts about this issue with the expert. And if you have questions that the ex ex uh, expert can correct any misinformation or to help you to move along further. Um, we ask you to consider this just the kickoff of the starting this conversation in the community. Uh, we hope we come out of here today with the single most effective and or best course of action for us to take as a community to move forward to bring awareness of sex trafficking and perhaps to be able to help to find a way to put together um, a facility that might be of benefit or a program over the long term uh, so that we can address this poor issue. Um, there are four questions that you're going to be addressing today. Your facilitator has them. Um, and we are going to look at those. Do you have the menu? Oh, here they go. Here we go. Um, one is, uh, just so that you can start thinking about them, uh, who's most at risk of becoming a trafficking victim? Uh, what can we do to prevent our children within the community from falling prey? Uh, what do we do if, the if a situation seems suspicious or we feel a child may need, he need help? And then the final question is, how can we bring awareness to the community? Your host uh, moderator will be taking notes. They're also your timekeeper. We only have 20 minutes for this exercise, so I ask you to keep your comments really brief. Your facilitator will help to uh, stimulate the conversation around the table and, and make sure that the conversation continues to move. And um, we look forward to hearing your ideas and suggestions and really appreciate you being here, not only so that we can learn from the experts, but the experts can learn from us, and then we can work together to solve this horrible problem. So thank you for being here. Thank you again to Dina and our table captains and facilitators. I will give you a five minute warning so that we can make sure we wrap up and one person from each table, our table host, will do um, a quick recap of the top suggested item that comes from each table at the end. So we're um, on a time frame, so I will um, prompt you whenever we're at our five minute warning. Thank you. We are going to wrap up in the consideration of time. I know many of you need to get on with your day. Um, our d ideas from today will be incorporated into a formal report to the Board of County Commissioners and distributed to attendees via email. Please make sure that you have either left a business card at the table or you have provided your contact information on the um, notepads that are there that we may collect. And if you've got any notes or suggestions or questions or anything else that you'd like to leave for further um, consideration, please do that as well. At this time, do I have a table that would like to volunteer to be first? Linda, you are such an overachiever. I love it. Remember to please keep this brief and um, as original as you can. And um, we are going to go all the way around. And we are taking notes on, on these. And we'll share out these ideas with everyone. Can you hear me? Hang on. Can you hear me? Hang on. We need it for HTV. OK. Our um, table came up with a couple of ideas. The one that we thought might be most effective is to use our first line of defense to increase awareness by working through the school system. The second thing we thought would be good would be to use PSAs, to, that would just be um, free PSAs on the media. Save all the ideas for other people, come on. Who, who's speaking over here, Dottie? Yeah, we also thought the school system to engage um, the, the school system in educating the school system so they could also in turn educate uh, parents and community and students. But we also thought that it would be absolutely wonderful to collaborate together in having one unifying website with a central website with all of this information for the community. So somehow 
collaborate together to have one unifying website. Thank you. Well done. No, you can speak, Molly. Come on. We thought that we needed to have a, um, some sort of messaging that uh, is clear uh, that we would promote and then that wherever you would go, you would have a bumper sticker or, or a, a sticker in a uh, McDonald's or any of the restaurants that would have a hotline that you could call for help, but that before we had that, that there would have to be some sort of messaging campaign that would like buckle up or whatever your messaging campaign is, that when they saw the hotline number, it would, the, the branding would connect with the number. So that would have to come first. Thank you. Over here, Ms. Twine. Thank you. Our, our table thought that first and foremost, we still think that aware, personal awareness is so very important, and we thought capitalizing on educational opportunities within our routine sphere of influence to go again with personal awareness and what each person can do. Uh, and for effectiveness, we thought uh, a training curriculum that's fact-based, tailored uh, information that be, could be used throughout our system, uh, beginning with uh, the, the foster care and first responders and all people who deliver services to all of us. Very good, thank you. Coming this way. Rachel? Well, I was, I was really happy to hear how many great ideas we had and that you know, everyone really seemed to be thinking along the same lines, so I think that's, that's good. One of, one of the things that came out of our discussion that I thought was, uh, was a really good idea was we have so many people in this community who are really passionate and really ready to get involved, um, very charitably minded, and you know, if they know about an issue, and, and they're told about it, and, and they're approached in, in the right way, um, they can be the best champions for um, you know, raising the money that I know we need for some of these services that we don't have, getting out the word like we're planning to do after meeting here. So I think that if the people who are really involved on an everyday um, level in dealing with this issue connect with um, people like us here, uh, with for the example that came out of our table was Tampa Connections. Um, where we part, Tampa Connection partners with other uh, charity organizations, that could be a really good opportunity for opening it up to, um, to other professionals in this community and letting them know what, what's going on and, and getting them to be uh, supporters of, of solving this problem. Wonderful, thank you. Laura? Hi. We thought uh, along the lines of education that maybe they could co incorporate something into the health classes. Okay, and also maybe setting up a text alert because a lot of kids that text now that maybe they could have alert that they could send. Okay, right, that they could go look. I like it. Thank you. Yeah. Who do we have here? Oh, Denise. Well, I think we're all thinking along the same lines. But one of the things that uh, the text behind said that he can bring these children in, but there's no place to put them. And so I guess number one most important thing is find a safe house so that they have access to what they need, medical care, and they feel safe. And we discussed the schools and PTAs, and um, the major issue that we think our um, detective McLean said is political correctness, and what we have to do is make this a non-political effort, but a human effort. So it has to be a bipartisan, across-the-board collaboration. The magic words. Mindy? Thank you. Like everyone else, uh, we thought that education and the front lines was going to be the most powerful way to affect change um, and that we could advocate for a mandated uniform curriculum in the schools around the state, um, layered perhaps locally for us with Hillsborough, uh, in Hillsborough with Kids on the Block, Crisis Center, the Spring, More Health, they all have curricula in the schools. So if we could build on what's already going on in the schools and not reinvent the wheel, um, and then have some sort of statewide curricula as well that we could 
saturate uh, the market. Um, also add to the foster parents training curriculum because um, we know that foster children are a particularly vulnerable population. So it's getting out the message um, to all the areas uh, of the community in multiple ways, um, publicizing the hotline. And then um, finally, I think one of the biggest challenges that um, one of our table members identified is that so many people um, in many neighborhoods in our community think of human smuggling when they think of trafficking. They think about folks being smuggled in from third world countries as the folks we're talking about. They don't realize that it's happening to our children in our community who were born and raised here. Um, it happens to everyone. It's just important to help the folks from out of the country, but they don't really realize it's a problem that could affect their individual child. So really helping them understand we're talking about something that is occurring to people in their own communities and neighborhoods. Thank you very much. Lydia. There was a lot of very good ideas in this uh, table number seven, but we thought that the, uh, to create awareness, the best thing to do is uh, do presentations, commercials, and media relations. I'm saving y'all for last. I'm really excited about what's gonna come out of the University of Tampa. Good morning, it sounds like there was a lot of consensus in the room. Our number one priority was educating the public um, and that's been repeated around the room. And we came up with a brilliant idea that's already been said about a sticker program in businesses where they train their employees to identify um, victims, the young victim that's at McDonald's and doesn't feel connected, um, to be aware of those situations and identify and have a sticker on their, um, their windows that say they're a safe place and predators don't come here. Great. Okay, Linda, I can't wait. We're a table of educators, and thank you so much. We had great outreach, kinds of commentary, too. But the most poignant thing came from one of our students who said, we have to put a human face on this. We have to put a Tampa face on this. And the most powerful way to educate is to, be, to have our stories. We need local stories to bring this issue home. Very well. Yes, one more comment. I would be remiss, I almost forgot, to your point with the local stories, we have Larry Jopek from WEDU here, and they are actively working to try and do a documentary on human trafficking for our community. So the human face, if they're able to find the funding, so if anyone has funding in the room, um, uh, so if, if they can uh, do a documentary in PSAs, that's gonna go a long way in our community, just like um, with domestic violence and ABC has done for domestic violence in our community. I think WEDU could be a trailblazer for us. So support them. Thank you. I, um, I think y'all should give yourselves a round of applause. You all did good work this morning. Um, as I said, there will be a summary email that comes out and I hope that you've met some new friends today um, to collaborate and work together. Um, there are handouts at the table in the back if you're looking for more information, and please take the folder that was provided at your place for easy reference. There's some good information in there. Um, may I take a moment to thank Brandon Wagner, our staff support from the county. He is one of the most dedicated professionals that I have ever had the pleasure of working with, and we could not do our work in the Hillsborough Commission on the Status of Women without him. So, Brandon, thank you so much. Again, love you, man. Appreciate it. I also have a thank you gift for each of our speakers. If y'all, Mayor Pam, Detective McBride, and Laura Hamilton would come up, and I have goodies for you. Um, there is a special treat also on your table for each of you to take with you, and you, it's the cookie that is labeled with the COSW. I have a challenge for you. You can choose to enjoy this if you like, or you could share it with someone today and um, share with them where you were this morning and what you learned. So I encourage you to, to enjoy and share your cookie. There is also 
Out at the front desk, the Women's Hall of Fame nominations were due today. We have extended that deadline by a couple of days, um, a week. If you have any nominations that you'd like to get in, we've got some wonderful women that have already been submitted for consideration. But if anybody in the room has anyone else, there is an additional amount of time for the Women's Hall of Fame. And um, we do have a door prize at each table. Did we do, we did our, oh, it's a dot on the back of your folder. So turn your folder over. And if so, you win this package. <laughs> yes. So the, book, the door prize is a book called Renning Lacey, and it's a very compelling story which will give you a deeper look into this issue. At this time, we will adjourn. Thank you for your time and your interest and your hard work today. And I hope everyone has a wonderful holiday season. Thank you very much.